Anyway, take your teaching notes out. We're going to just do a one-week teaching this week on uh, talking about heroes. Where are the heroes? I've been thinking a lot about that. Uh, I've been doing some historical reading. I'm a student of history. I I love history. And so I've been doing some reading and uh, came across this quote from G.K. Chesterton. Writing during the early part of the 20th century, this is what he said. The trouble when people stop believing in God is not that they thereafter believe in nothing. It's that they thereafter believe in anything. Ours is a time where an increasing number of people have stopped believing in God. And because they've stopped believing in God, it's not that they don't believe in anything or in nothing, it's that they'll believe in anything. In fact, let me just kind of go where angels fear to tread. I believe that Michael Jackson was amazingly talented, unbelievably gifted uh, young man, and yet clearly lived a sad and tragic life. But it is also a commentary on American society that so much of the airwaves and the ink space are being spent on his passing, which is, again, I think it was amazingly talented and a sad and tragic uh, life, too short uh, to have it ended. But you just think about that and think, gosh, where are the heroes of American society, like those pilgrims who fled religious persecution to seek religious freedom here, like those uh, founders of the American Revolution who literally put fame and fortune on the line, like those in the First and Second World War who defended literally uh, the Atlas for freedom. I have a friend in Nashville, Tennessee, who is a political speech writer, and this is a nonpartisan speech that he wrote. He sent it to me after I'd already finished preparing my teaching, but I thought, boy, I just have to share this. I think the thoughts about freedom are so powerful. Here's what my friend wrote. We will never fully comprehend, he's by the way speaking about the Second World War generation and those of us that have followed. We will never fully comprehend what that generation and many other generations before and after World War II lost or left on foreign beaches in swampy jungles, desert plains, and blown out buildings. And yet my grandfather, my, your spouse, siblings, and children have faced death so that you and I may breathe life. Is that not freedom? Freedom is expression of the soul. Is freedom not life? With this great freedom has come great sacrifice. And in our times today, as North Korea threatens our border, as Iran punishes those who cling to and long for life, and even democracy is threatened in Central America, you and I must make a pledge. A pledge similar to what my grandfather made, that our forefathers held. A pledge of old that you and I must re-vow and carry to a new generation, a pledge similar to one made by a fallen American soldier who would later have his story told. President Reagan recounted the sacrifice of this soldier in his first inaugural address. In referring to the grave markers of Arlington, our former president related the following. Under one such marker lies a young man, Martin Trepto, who left his job in a small town barber shop in 1917 to go to France with a famed Rainbow Division. There on the Western Front, he was killed trying to carry a message between two battalions under heavy fire. We're told that on his body was found a diary, and on the flyleaf under the heading, My Pledge, he had written these words, America must win this war. Therefore, I will work. I will save. I will sacrifice. I will endure. I will fight cheerfully and do my utmost, as if the issue of the whole struggle depended on me alone. The crisis we're facing today does not require of us the kind of sacrifice that Martin Trepto and so many thousands of others were called upon to make. But it does require, however, our best effort and our willingness to believe in ourselves and believe in our capacity to perform great deeds, to believe that together with God's help we can and will resolve the problems which now confront us. And after all, why shouldn't we believe that? We are Americans. And on this 4th of July, we again are facing perilous times. May history record of this moment that our generation answered the call, that we paid the price and we kept the pledge. May our commitment to American freedom be so steadfast. Our willingness to sacrifice run so deep. Our steadfastness concerning liberty be so sure that the future must write of us, you and I, that we fought as if the struggle depended upon us alone. And as the historians judge our work, our victory, may their conclusion, the final sentence on the history of the present day, report this, and I quote, And of course, they did all they could do. 
because they were Americans. A number of years ago, Supreme Court nominee Judge Robert Bork wrote a book called Slouching Towards Gomorrah. And in that book, he suggested that America had left its Judeo-Christian roots. And while I'm not here to debate the merits of whether or not he was right or not, anybody who was alive during the 1950s and then thinks about life in the modern day experience of America would at least say this. In the 1950s, however flawed and failing American society was, and it was flawed and failing, however flawed and failing American society was, made up of imperfect people, it was clear that the basic foundations of American society were a Judeo-Christian worldview. Fast forward 50 years, it seems equally clear to me that in our day and age, we have lost a defining moral center that we do not have a fundamental established foundation of a Judeo-Christian worldview. So former Supreme Court nominee Robert Bork could say that America was slouching towards Gomorrah. I would suggest of greater concern is not whether or not we are slouching towards Gomorrah, but whether the church is slinking towards irrelevance. It seems to me that since the local church is the hope of the world, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the good news, that we live in a time that desperately is in need of American heroes. So I've been thinking about this whole notion of American heroes. What are American heroes like today? And what about Christians? What about the church? And then I came across this quote from Oz Guinness. It's a great quote. It's in your program. The problem with Christians in America is not that Christians aren't where they should be. The problem is that they're not what they should be right where they are. It's not that Christians aren't where they should be. It's that we are not what we should be right where we are. Well, that led me on a trail of thinking. I began to consider, if it is true that in the last 50 years we've had dramatic changes in American society and the basic prevailing worldview, what does that mean for us as a church? What does it mean for Christianity? I know ultimately Christianity doesn't only thrive in societies where the gospel is honored and there's a basic Judeo-Christian worldview, in fact. You should know that this morning there are men and women around the world who don't have the freedom to assemble for worship. There are men and women around the world who literally tear precious pages of a Bible that's been given to them and they distribute pages of the Bible because they don't have access to the resources that we here have here in the United States of America. The freedom that we have is amazing. But then I got to thinking about the early church. In the first century, in the first century, the early church literally not only thrived, but it exploded in a very hostile environment. And as I was thinking about that, that led me to 1 Peter chapter 2. I want to encourage you, if you have a Bible, to turn to 1 Peter 2. If you don't have a Bible, it'll be up on the screens overhead. If you'd like to get a Bible, you can just stop at Guest Central. We'll give you a Bible. We'd love for you to have that to be a part of your daily experience in, with God. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter writes to some folks who are Christians, Christ followers, who've been scattered in the midst of a pagan empire. An empire where the cost of being Christian was increasingly a difficult price to pay. He writes these words. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves, for the Lord's sake, to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors, who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. While it may be true that you never have the opportunity to write a document like the Declaration of Independence or sign your name there to be willing to sacrifice fame and fortune for the establishment of a new nation. And while it may be true that you don't have the opportunity to fight in something like the cause of World War II, which was clearly good versus evil, I want to suggest to you that the church is desperately in need and our nation is desperately in need of American heroes. And I want to go even one more step towards a shocking reality and that is that I believe American heroes are in this room. That God is calling for us to be heroic 
in our following of God. The time is right for us to be heroes. So as I was reading this passage, there were five things that jumped out at me. I'm going to go through them fairly quickly, but five things that you can do to be a hero right now. One of the first things that heroes do, write this down in your notes, is heroes live as light in the darkness. We live as light in the darkness. The fact is, is that Christianity is a counterculture revolution. Christianity is a counterculture revolution. We have to swim against the tide. We have to be light in the darkness. Again, whatever your political persuasion. I think most people would agree, observing American history, that from about 1957 to 1964, at least statistically speaking, was the peak of Protestantism in in our current era. And then since then, approximately one half of the people attend church today as used to attend church in that 1957 to 1964 time period. So the reality is, as we face a world that is increasingly without a Judeo-Christian moral foundation, a world where the darkness seems to be more prevalent, that we have the opportunity to shine our light brightly. But tragically, sometimes what happens in the church is that you can't distinguish what happens in the church from what happens in the world around us. In 1 John chapter 2, we read these words, Don't love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, and by the way, when it says world, it's talking about the world system, the values. Everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. How do you live as heroes in the modern world? I I think you live as light in the darkness. As the darkness gets darker, the light shines brighter. I love the fact that here at CBC we have a food pantry. If you serve or participate in the food pantry, I think that's one way of being light in the darkness. I was just told before service that our little garden project out there has its first three tomatoes. Uh, Those are starting to now produce, and we're going to use that food to supplement what we do in the food pantry and to give to folks who have need. I, I believe that's being Jesus with skin on. There's a ministry that some of you participate in that once a month takes these bags and puts a personal toiletry items in them, and then they're delivered to the shelters all over our area. I think that's being light in the darkness. Uh, Many of you go to visit folks who are in prison. Jesus said that by doing that, by offering a cup of cold water in his name, that you are being Jesus with skin on. I really believe that we have to live as light in the darkness, that people can be drawn to relationship with Christ. I think that's heroic. It's counterculture. I'm reading a book right now called Servolution. See, there might have been a day, it was somewhere between 1957 and 1964, where you could go to a community, you could build a church, you could erect it, you could put stained glass in and a steeple, and you can open the door, and any weekend there'd be a bunch of people. But folks, the truth is, is that for many folks in our world, the church is slinking towards irrelevance. And I'm convinced that one of the ways that we will be able to turn the tide is that we will be Jesus with skin on in our world. We'll meet needs in the name of Jesus. We'll live as light in the midst of darkness. Here's a second way that you can be heroic that I get from this passage, and that is we need to learn to submit to civil government as a witness for Christ. To submit to civil government as a witness for Christ. I'll come back to that in just a moment, but let me set a little marker here. Submitting to civil government does not mean that you contradict the laws of God. Write down in your notes, Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John were whipped, they were imprisoned. Then they were told by the ruling authorities that they would be released on one condition. They would be released if they would refuse to testify about Jesus Christ. Peter has a glorious response. He says, look, you better keep us in prison then, because the deal is this, we cannot not testify about Jesus Christ. So if that's our condition for release, then don't release us. And the bottom line, he says, we must obey God and not men. So if a a law of civil government ever contradicts a direct law of God, we're bound not to uh, obey civil government, but to obey God's law. On the other hand, Scripture tells us repeatedly in a number of different places that we should submit to civil authority. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Now, we have an amazing privilege here in the United States. We live in a system called a representative democracy. You get the right, if you're an American citizen, to participate in this representative democracy. So one of the ways that you can be heroic is to participate, to vote, to study the issues, to begin to grapple with what are the great issues of our time, and to do insofar as possible your voting in a way that lines up with God's Word. Here's a second way to be heroic. There are many Christians who feel called to serve in elected office. And I want to encourage you. We've recently had a spate of scandals 
people who have been known as Christians serving in public office, and they end up falling into immorality. It's the same as when preachers fall. It ends up causing a huge wave of scandal. People go, see, they're no different than anybody else. I want to ask you to do this. I'm not in any way, shape, or form excusing the behavior of those who have abused public trust, but I am asking you to do this. When you hear of a Christian who serves in high elected office, would you pray for them? When a person stands for God and good and His glory, and they serve in a high uh, elected office, they become a target. They have a huge bullseye on their back. The Bible tells this about the enemy of our soul. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He'll do everything he can to destroy those people who want to shine their light brightly for Christ. But I want to honor those who serve in elected public office. I want to thank those of you who serve in state and local governments as a way for you to honor Christ with your life. I want to thank you for that. I also want to thank those who advocate for life and truth. I think that's a powerful way to submit to civil government but advocate for life and truth in a way that honors God. Here's a third way you can be heroic in your life, and that is to show respect for everyone. You know, we live in an increasingly uncivil society where people who have huge disagreements can't sit down at the same table and talk to each other without getting into a fight. The reality is, folks, by showing respect, we can have a huge impact. Look what Colossians says. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. The fact is, when we show respect and civility to other people, it has huge impact. If you work in retail, you know this. By your service in retail, you have to deal with the public all the time. Holy cow. Sometimes the public, and we are it, folks, but sometimes the public is a pain in the backside. Am I right about that? But if you serve in retail, one of the greatest things that you can do is just show respect and civility to people, show kindness to them, and by doing that, you can end up making an impact on their life. If you're raising a good and godly family, I want to thank you for that. If you're a teacher in a public school or private school and you're sowing into the lives of children, I want to thank you for that. Recently, we had a situation in our family that was just kind of a fun demonstration to me of this. A couple weeks ago was Father's Day. I think this is about the third, second or third year that we've done this. I kind of like to, on Father's Day, have a little barbecue, and then we go play sports at a local park. And uh, boys are getting big enough, so it's kind of fun. And so we went out, and we uh, decided to go play wiffle ball, okay? And uh, I was the pitcher. I was doing great strikes that day. It was amazing. It was awesome. Purpose is not to strike them out it, it, just once. Um, and then to, to let them hit it. And so we were playing this wiffle ball game. We are having a lot of fun. And I don't know for sure if this lady was a single mom or not, but she had two young children on the playground near where we were playing. And I think, let's say maybe they were five and seven, something like that. And so we could tell that they wanted to play, so we invited them over. We, we got them involved in the game, and I was pitching, and they hit. It was awesome. It was great. So we did this for about 25 or 30 minutes, and uh, then I think we got called for dessert or something like that. So we kind of collapsed the game and we went away. And, and it was an extended family thing. So one of our extended family members came from out of town, uh, went and talked to the lady who had these two little small kids. And the lady said, oh, it's so fun. Thanks for inviting us. And then said, who was that guy who was pitching? And... Uh, the extended family member said, oh, that's uh, John. He's the pastor of the church, Carson Valley Christian Center. A and here's what the lady said. The lady said, oh, I didn't know that Christians could be so nice. Okay, now that's cool that she thought that Christians were nice, but how sad. How sad that her initial perspective, based on, you know, whatever's in our culture, whatever's in our media, is that Christians are mean. As a church, we, we, and as people who follow Christ, if you show respect to people, if you show kindness to people, man, you open doors on what is often very hard and closed down hearts. Show respect to folks. Here's number four. Love followers of Christ. I think when we love followers of Christ, fellow travelers, it makes the body of Christ, the family of God, be attractive to others. Jesus said to his disciples, they will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. A historian, not a Christian, not a Christ follower, writing in the first century about the early church said this, behold how they love one another. The distinguishing mark of the early church was their love for one another. I think it is a heroic action to demonstrate love to other people in God's family. In fact, some of us make it so hard, it really is heroic uh, to love us. Several of you have told me recently uh, about heroic actions on your part, and that is that people have come around you when you've had medical difficulties, financial difficulties, when you've been struggling, and it's been the people in the body of Christ, folks in small groups uh, who are committed in relationships. I think those are heroic actions. You can be a hero by doing those things. Number five, honor your heritage. Honor your heritage. Folks, we need to realize the amazing privileges that we have. 
every year at Fourth of July, I kind of grapple between twin concerns, so I want to do that right now and just tell you what I grapple with as a teacher. Number one, I just want you to know this, the value of a soul in America and in Africa and in Australia, the value of a soul wherever it is on planet Earth is equal to God. The ground at the foot of the cross is equal. So in that respect, Americans are of no greater value to God than, any, than people of any other nation. On the other hand, each one of us who have the amazing privilege to live in the United States of America are recipients of an unbelievable trust from heaven. We have great freedom. We can worship God. We can pursue Him. And we live in an amazing land of opportunity. We live in the greatest nation on the face of the earth. And that is a tremendous stewardship. So I want to do this just as a matter of personal privilege because we all stand on the shoulders of those who've gone on before. If you were alive during the Second World War, it doesn't matter if you're a little child or if you actually were alive uh, as a teenager or an adult, uh, if you were alive during the Second World War, would you stand? If you were alive during the Second World War, would you stand? Would you, as, a, as your pastor, could I just lead you in honoring the greatest generation? That generation, more than any other, made amazing sacrifices to secure the blessings of liberty in our lifetime. We would not have the freedoms that we have were it not for the sacrifice of that generation. Many of you in this room have participated not only in the Second World War, but in the wars and conflicts that have followed since then. You have served faithfully in Vietnam, and the Gulf War, in Korea, and other settings like that, and you have done so. And I just want to honor that heritage. We need to be respectful. I, I, I'm a student of history, so I guess maybe it comes a little bit easier to me. But I read a friend who has a, a blog, and he was including links to Schoolhouse Rock. Uh, where you can learn lessons about history. So maybe, you know, you need to go to that and just, just learn the basic history of America and be grateful for the fact that we are recipients of a tremendous trust. Now I want you to do this. I want to close with this. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to 16. I'm increasingly convinced this is core of what God wants us to learn as a church in order for us to be heroes. I, I think about the pilgrims. I think about the constitutional framers. I think about the founders of the American Revolution. I just am amazed at what tremendous gifts and sacrifice that they gave to us in the succeeding generations. But in Matthew chapter 5, it says this, you are the salt of the earth, speaking to followers of Christ, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Just as a quick little aside, in the first century, salt was used as a preservative. It was used as a curative. Uh, it would often, it had antiseptic qualities. But if salt lost its saltiness, you know what they did? They would take the salt and they would throw it out on the manure pile. The hope was that at least the remaining mineral content might do something into that manure, but it basically would work its way underneath the manure. So without going in a fully graphic explanation, if salt has lost its saltiness, it's lower than manure. So the writer of the Gospel of Matthew is saying, folks, you're the salt of the earth, but you've got to be salty. He goes on to say this, you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, so that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Write this down. I've said it before, and I'll say it many other times. Good deeds creates goodwill, which opens the door for sharing the good news. Folks, I really believe that there may have been a time in American society when the church could simply sort of throw open its door and go, hey, we're here, and people might have showed up for a sense of uh, you know, curiosity or a sense of oughtness, but folks, that doesn't exist anymore in our culture. And I'm convinced that what will break through the barriers that many people have erected is if we learn to love people and serve them in the name of Jesus. I really believe that that's the future for the church in America because I believe that the possibility exists that America's greatest days lie ahead. But they will only lie ahead if the people of God will repent of our sins, confess them before God, and humble ourselves and pray, and ask God to heal our land. Would you close your eyes with me? Father God, in this room, I think there are some amazing heroes. I think there's men and women in this room who are serving you faithfully, who are loving on others and just serving them in the strong name of Jesus. I know, Father God, there are men and women in this room who are connecting their lives to other Christ followers. 
I know there are men and women in this room who are submitting to civil government but working for change in a way that will give glory to you. There are those in this room who are living as light in the midst of darkness. Father God, I know that we want to not only honor our heritage, but we want to be the kind of people who lean in and say, how could you, God, accomplish your kingdom objectives in somebody like me? God, I pray that a spirit of heroism would just literally go throughout this auditorium, that we could be drawn to you, that we could be representatives of you, that the spirit of God would flow through us, that people will see our good deeds and not say good things about us, People would see our good deeds and glorify our Father who's in heaven. We ask all this in the strong, amazing, mighty, and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Just before we dismiss today, let me just share a little bit of an update on next week. Uh, next week, uh, we're literally, and I know that you won't like to hear this, we're literally halfway through the summer. Um, I know that's a hard word for some of you, but we're halfway through the summer uh, next weekend. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to talk about how to make the most of your summer. We'll evaluate a little bit of what's happened so far and then kind of give you a six to eight week thing to say, how do I make the most out of my summer and uh, enjoy it and, and also benefit from it? So that's next weekend. Love to have you come. We're also going to do the recap of uh, high school Hume Lake. It'll be a great experience. Stand up with me. On the count of three, we're going to say, Happy Birthday, America, okay? Count of three, Happy Birthday, America. One, two, three. Happy Birthday, America. Have a good day. God bless you. Thanks for being here.